Welcome to the Growth Busters podcast. Here we discuss our society's addiction to growth, and we do our best to chart a sustainable course for human civilization. Because we've got a planet to save. Calling, 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 calling. Call the Growth Busters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, we have a really exciting guest today on the podcast, Joshua Spodek. And our main topic today, is sustainable living not your job or mine? Do we all get to sit on our butts and do nothing, waiting for our unsustainable system to change? Now, I'm being a little bit snarky about it, but I hope that makes my point. You know where I stand, don't you? Well, I'm Dave Gardner, Growth Buster in Chief, and with me today... Hi, I'm Erica Arias, co-host and co-producer of the Growth Busters podcast. For cutting edge information about our culture's unsustainable love affair with growth and what we can do about it, visit growthbusters.org. So Dave, before we dive into another informative episode of the Growth Busters podcast, and before we introduce Joshua, let's go ahead and dig into our inbox for some listener feedback. Let's do it. We've got a long but very interesting and informed email from Rob Bowman in Oregon. And I'm just going to share a little bit of it with you because, like I said, it's long. Rob wrote, Hello, I just listened to podcast number 35, Uncoupling Nonsense. You know what? I think that episode was actually called Decoupling Nonsense, wasn't it, Erica? It was. Yeah. Yeah. Minor correction. I could send a lot of stuff, and I'm in the process of developing a website. But for now, you might find this interesting. I call it... The 15 Criteria Points of Genuine, Meaningful Sustainability. What people commonly refer to as sustainability is not truly sustainable. This is point one. For example, people will refer to sustainably harvested lumber. Lumber may be harvested in a manner that is not destructive of forest ecosystems, but in order for lumber to be sustainably harvested... Not only would the chainsaws and logging trucks need to be running on something other than fossil fuels, but the chainsaws and logging trucks would need to be manufactured using something other than fossil fuels. When you consider the amount of energy required to make a large metal object like a logging truck, it is clear that even Forest Stewardship Council certified lumber is far from sustainable. Interesting point. Number two, genuine, meaningful sustainability is defined by a rigorous set of criteria, including but not limited to the use of non-renewable resources and the impossibility of infinite growth on a finite planet. Point three, it therefore follows that achieving genuine, meaningful sustainability is a dauntingly complex, remote, far-flung ideal. It will be very difficult to achieve. Number four, as difficult as it may be, genuine, meaningful sustainability will be achieved because to do anything less is unsustainable. Whatever the human family fails to do voluntarily, we will do involuntarily. It is possible that we will become a sustainable, advanced, complex civilization. On the other hand, dust blowing in the wind is sustainable. Point five, and this is the last one I'll share here. The longer we wait, the longer we procrastinate, delay, and make excuses, the more wrenching and traumatic the transition to sustainability will be. We are squandering precious time and resources presently. We have used up approximately half of our one-time geological allotment of fossil fuels. The remaining half will be increasingly more expensive and energy-intensive to extract. We should be feverishly using the remaining half to construct the post-fossil fuel infrastructure that we will need. This is especially the case when considering climate change. Fully preparing for life without fossil fuels could take decades. Also, it is not at all clear just how everything we do with fossil fuels can be accomplished with wind, solar, and biofuels. The time to begin that transition is not when fossil fuels are dwindling and the economy is collapsing. Now, we sadly don't have time to uh, share the rest, which is really just as insightful and important, but we've posted the entire email in the show notes for this episode at growthbusters.org. So I suggest you, uh, if we piqued your interest, go check out the show notes for this episode at the website and read the whole thing. Yeah. Thanks to Rob from Oregon. Really, really good points. It's kind of the perfect time for an email like that. I feel like just with everything going on and 
Corona sort of taking over. It's one of the ways that we're really just unprepared. Any thoughts? Well, I think it's pretty funny that it didn't take you long to bring up the coronavirus. And while you were getting set up, Erica, Joshua and I were talking about whether we should even bring up the subject. It's literally (laughs) everywhere. (laughs) I don't know what else to talk about. We haven't let Joshua say a word yet. I'm sure he's breathing a sigh of relief. Great. She <laughs> she broke the subject. So why don't we quickly introduce him so that he can react to what we've been talking about already. <laughs> Joshua, I'm sorry for, for doing that to you. We should have uh, officially brought you in earlier. But, uh, but let's do it now. I want to just tell our listeners a little bit about you. Joshua Spodek is the author of two best-selling books, Initiative and Leadership Step-by-Step. And he's host of the podcast, Leadership and the Environment. And I got to make a note. I think, Joshua, you started that well after I launched the Growth Busters podcast, but you have, I don't know, something like six times the number of episodes that we have. So you are a quite prolific podcaster. And in addition to that, you're a professor at NYU. Joshua holds a PhD, get this, in astrophysics and an MBA from Columbia. Uh, He teaches and coaches leadership and entrepreneurship at NYU and Columbia Business School. He's done two TEDx talks. Uh, Hopefully we'll get a chance to chat a little bit about that during this episode. But you know what the most important thing about Joshua is that I want everyone to know is it takes Josh 16 months to produce one load of garbage, and he hasn't flown on a plane in four years. So welcome to the podcast, Josh. Welcome, Josh. Thank you. And I'll mention that I listen, I believe I've listened to every one of your podcasts. So to make me wait is no problem. I'd either listen now or I'd listen later. So I was (laughs) glad to hear it. And uh, I'm actually, today's, as we were recording, it's March 16th. March 23rd will begin my fifth year of not flying. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Wow. And that's intentional. That's not, you know, something that was forced on you. Yeah. In fact, I never planned to do it. By the time that I heard that flying New York, LA round trip warmed the globe a year's worth of driving. And that's what I heard from, uh, I forget his name, who wrote uh, Sustainability Without the Hot Air from Oxford, I think. His name will come to me in a minute. A book I recommend for everyone. And I thought, I wonder if I could go for a year without flying. And I thought that would be impossible. And within a few months of trying it anyway, I realized that I could find almost everything that I wanted from flying without the without the jet exhaust. And... A lot of people think it's a really hard thing to do. The change was hard, but now it's it I can't tell you how much it's joy and community and connection that comes from living in a place and not feeling like you have to escape all the time. So I jump jump into that. That's pretty amazing, especially you live in New York City, right? Yeah. I would want to escape all the time if I lived in New York. <laughs> Well, that's actually something people often say, well, Josh, you live in New York, so you can get all this cultural stuff. You can just take the seven train and be off in, you know, in, <laughs> you don't see any, there's no English language, anything in, you know, pick your stop and it, it's different languages. Well, I chose to live in a place that I really love. If you live in a place where you don't like it and you have to get away all the time, that's a problem that you got to fix. Yeah. I picked a place that I love. And if I didn't love New York, I'd pick a place elsewhere that I love. So... I think that if people really love something, anyone can do for themselves what I did for myself. I don't think people should live my life. I believe if people try to implement for themselves their environmental values, they will be able to create a life that they like more because that's what living by your values means. Value, good, bad, evaluate. It's If you choose things that you like more, you'll like your life more. Yeah, I think and this could be an important point that we circle back to at some point during this episode. It's not like you're telling everybody, don't fly or you can't fly. You're just sharing the joy of the decision that you made and the life that you're living. Yeah. It really starts with examining what values I want to live by. And if I weren't doing the environment, I'd be doing the other parts of my life anyway. The unexamined life is not worth living is a phrase that has stood the test of time for a reason. Yeah. Look, if someone out there really honestly believes the best thing they can do is just profligately burn fossil fuels and generate trash. I can't really work with someone like that, that I'm, but I'm not going to. I'm going to engage with others because I don't know anyone who wants mercury in their fish. I don't know anyone who wants their kids to have asthma. And if they don't want those things, they can do stuff to act on that. A couple of reasons why we invited 
Joshua to be on this podcast, and we've been really trying to get this organized for probably six months now. We're going to put a link in the show notes. Joshua's podcast is always really interesting, and your blog and everything you're doing is really pretty fascinating stuff. You're a very thoughtful person. I have a lot of respect for you. And I began to think, you know, it would be kind of neat to uh, see if we couldn't figure out a way for Joshua to be a recurring regular guest on the podcast. And it was so difficult to get this one arranged. I'm not sure if we're going to pull that off, but this might be a pilot for that, uh, although this is going to be a nice long conversation. But uh, the other reason that we really wanted today to have this conversation is that there are some subjects that are pretty important to us right now on the front burner that you have had some pretty good thoughts about. And the big one, the main topic for today is the value of individual action. I really want to have a good conversation about that because it seems like lately there seem to be a number of people that are trying to convince everybody that individual action is a kind of a waste. Why bother? The system needs to change and it's almost impossible. The system's against us. It's impossible for us to to live sustainably. So it's a distraction for you to be working on uh, shrinking your footprint. You should just be focusing on forcing the big evil system to change. Well, first, I can't help but mention that you're running for office, Growth Busters, the movie, these things are some of the major things that got me started. And so first of all, I'm very happy to participate. If it's this conversation, if there's more to come, all the better. Great. And you're one of the few voices and maybe one of the only people I know who's acting on, you know, who's identified that growth and the belief that growth will solve many problems as opposed to exacerbating them or even causing them it's one of the few voices out there, one of the few actors out there. So, and I, I just can't see how people can work on this very long before realizing what you've realized and are acting on. So this is to me where anything on the environment will eventually lead to our population. And not just population growth, but also economic growth and so forth. So yeah. uh, very glad to be here. As for personal action, I really hear that coming from people who are really acting a lot and really like not just straws, I'm not going to stop people from doing straws. (laughs) But I rarely hear that from people who are really getting things done. It feels to me a kind of... People like to engage in a kind of debate that distracts them from doing things. But the way that I really think about it after having acted a lot is I, I don't steal. I have no idea whether my not stealing will stop other people from stealing. I don't know if it'll stop anyone from stealing at all. But even if the whole world steals, I will still not steal. I don't want to pollute other people's worlds. I don't steal not because I expect to stop other people from stealing. I do it because I don't want to hurt people. I minimize my pollution because I don't want to hurt people. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't affect anyone else, I'm still not going to do it because I don't want to hurt them. And now, separately from what I do myself for my own conscience, for my own sense of integrity, I also separately try to lead others. That's the podcast and my consulting and things like that. Mm -hmm. And now, if I wanted to lead someone I don't believe that my simply living by my values will lead others. I I hope that I'm a role model. I hope that people see what I do and say, I would like to do that too. But I don't expect that what I do myself is going to do that. Now, I do want to lead others because I believe that when I lead them, they are glad. They thank me. They they say they're happier. I don't think that I could effectively lead people to do something that I myself am not doing. So my personal actions open the door for me to lead others and I lead others. I do both of these things. Yeah. And to say either or is to me missing the point. For me to do these things also gives me experience and knowledge and beliefs. As far as I know, there are virtually none, virtually no leaders of global renown or even national renown who have tried to live sustainably themselves. And because they haven't... Now, some people out there will say, well, they're hypocrites or they're greenwashing or something like that. That's not my interest to label... What I notice is that by not trying to live these values themselves, they have not experienced that after they really start doing it, they start feeling the joy and community and connection that comes from living by their values. And in general, everyone I see who acts on these things, you tend to connect with people around you. It tends to create community and you tend to enjoy it. Since they haven't experienced that joy, they can't share that joy and tell others to expect to experience it. The message I hear from virtually all would-be leaders is 
you know, something really horrible may happen in the future. In order to avoid it, we have to do something horrible now. And so given the choice between possible horrible later and definitely horrible now, they've led people to choose, well, I'll, I'll deal with later. Take my chances. They can't effectively yeah. lead people because they don't have the experience themselves. And I'm sure there are lots of things you can learn just by reading books and watching TED videos. But leadership and influencing others is not one of them. This is a behavioral thing. You have to learn through practice. I don't know any leader that simply became a great leader from reading books, or for that matter, any great athlete who became a great athlete by reading books. You have to practice. You have to rehearse. And a friend of mine, his, his wife sings opera. And after she sings, apparently a lot of times people will come up and say to her, here's a little thing you could do to make it a little better. Now, she's been singing on stage for a long time, and the people in the audience have not. <laughs> <laughs> but they've read books. They've taken a few lessons, but they haven't been up on stage. And so he says, I can't believe how patient she is <laughs> listening to them saying stuff that she knows already, and they don't know what they're talking about. And in the air of the environment, people who have not acted, I'm going to say this very bluntly, they don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea what it takes to act on the environment. It is not a matter of knowing how methane works, how carbon dioxide works, or how plastic fills the oceans. It's the social and emotional things of if you start doing this, you have to figure out how to prioritize your time, how to deal with people who doubt you, how to deal with, how to find resources. These are the things that every time you try something new, if you learn how to play a musical instrument or a sport, you have to not just practice the instrument, you have to figure everything else out. That's what's challenging. Anyone can go without plastic cups for a while, but then at some point you realize, what do I do? I'm really, I really want some coffee and the only the option here is what do you do in a situation like that? Or what do you do when you visit a friend and they offer you something and they're trying to be generous and they're trying to be kind yeah. and it's like this plastic cup uh -huh. and do you accept it or do you, now do you have to go through this whole thing of like, well, I appreciate it and the thought means everything to me, but I have to politely decline. That stuff, that's what's really at heart. And if you haven't done it, you don't know what you're talking about and you think you do. And so we have a world full of people saying, I've read a bunch about this. I'm an expert and here's what you should do. And then someone else says, well, actually, I'm an expert, and here's what you should do. Well, I'm an expert, here's what you should do. And it's a whole bunch of people who actually don't know from experience what to do. <laughs> and I'm a big fan. I got a PhD. I got all these Ivy League degrees. I'm a big fan of, of like textbook learning and watching TED videos. I've watched a bunch of them. But ultimately, you have to act. And until you act, you're like someone who's read about piano but hasn't played piano. And maybe you can play chopsticks, but you're not going to do much more. The... One thing that, if I'm not going on too long, uh, one thing that I try to bring out that I don't hear from almost anybody is that after you make the switch and after you do develop these things, you will enjoy it far beyond any expectations than you expected. There's something about the environment and clean air and whatever people act on, I believe we just resonate deeply with that you will inevitably start connecting with your husband, your wife, your kids, your boss, your, your neighbors in a way that you wouldn't have expected. I'm going to go way too blunt here, but when someone is addicted to something and they think about stopping, they see the withdrawal. They know the pain of the withdrawal. They expect that, but they don't see past it. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that when you go past it, I knew day 366 after when I said a year without flying, I knew for a fact day 366, I would be on a flight because I enjoy flying. I enjoy, and not the flying. I don't like being in an airplane. Yeah, who would? <laughs> I don't like the yeah. pat downs, but I like, you know, the Eiffel Tower. And I knew day 366, I would be on a flight until I experienced the joy. You know, I knew the, I knew the deprivation, but I didn't know the joy. And when I felt the joy, that's when I, and this was like two, three months in that I started saying, maybe I'll go for a second year. And now my life is full of the joy that came past the challenge and the community and the connection and actually flying it, it you say congratulations but it's actually the opposite of effort for me it would take me i don't know how much money it would take to get me on a flight but a lot wow. and maybe there's not enough it's just it's not interesting do you think there's something to be said about people who just don't have those experiences. I mean, similar to you, I actually would have reached my fifth year of not flying. Had it have not been having to fly for graduate visits this year, mm -hmm. I would have still kept on not flying for as long as possible. I haven't been in a plane since 2015, 
which I justified because it was a research internship. And this year it was getting into PhD programs and I had to visit. <laughs> I, I, I justified it. But I feel like it's sometimes easier for me. I also don't like being in a plane. And I feel like it's almost easier for me because I don't have that experience of, you know, visiting Europe or going around the world. I really have never really been anywhere. Do you feel like it would be easier for somebody like me compared to somebody who's used to having those experiences to sort of forego travel? Yeah, I think, th oh, uh, not forego travel because there's a lot of ways to travel. Or, without... I'm sorry. Yeah. Flying in an airplane. I'm sorry. So it's tough. It's going to depend. It's going to go case by case. And for me, I try to support people in achieving their goals. So I, I try not to focus too much on, on the low level detail. Uh, well, if you felt that what you did was right, then I support you in that decision. And I'm not going to criticize that. Actually, you can still fly and stay below the Paris Agreement recommendations. If that, you know, as a kind of not so arbitrary choice of where to draw the line. But sometimes you have to figure these things out. I can say for myself that I wish now that I'd changed earlier, which would have meant fewer overseas experiences. But I can't really change what I did in the past it's tough to say. I mean, some people, maybe flying more would make them want to fly yet more. Maybe not. If I'm working with someone or a group of people, I have to find out what values they have and what they want to work on, what they want to do, and I want to help them achieve those goals. So if someone doesn't want to fly, I can help them feel great about not flying. If someone really wants to fly, well, I'm going to work with someone else to help them achieve those goals, or I'll help them achieve what goals they can. On my podcast, I don't start by telling people, here's something you could do. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can't stand that. Here's one little thing you can do because it implies people don't want to do it. I'd like to start with what people, I ask them, what do you care about? Or I don't see, I say, what does the environment mean to you? What, what do you think about when you think about the environment? And I, well, most people's first answer is like this platitude of like, oh, children or something that, I mean, they care, if they have kids, they still cared about the environment before they had kids. Kids will amplify, but there's always something there's often many things, but when I go back and forth, something will come out. I was just talking to someone recently and he grew up by the ocean and he would stay in the ocean for like after dark. And he would like, he just loved being in the water. And a little while ago, he was visiting India and he was walking by the beach uh, on a causeway from a, from the beach to an island and some water splashed up and it was oily. And he was like, I would not go in that water. And the same thing happened in Singapore. And I went back and forth a bit to hear what he, what that meant to him, how that felt to have grown up with something and that's not accessible to people anymore. And he, it was visceral. It was in the gut from him. And now anyone listening to this, they might not have grown up by the beach, but they'll have something similar like that, probably. And then I said to him, is there something you could do to act on this? And he's sitting there, we're sitting there together and there, next to him is a water bottle, and a plastic single-use water bottle. And he looks at it and he's like, I guess I could stop using those. Mm -hmm. Now he's, he came up with it, not me. And I spoke later with a coworker of his. It turns out he's been buying pallets of these things on the company's money. And he'd buy like cases of bottled water. And she remarked to me that he wasn't doing that anymore. And now she was stopping. There you go. Now that's an aside. The thing is that he's doing it for himself. He liked what he was doing. He's doing it for his own intrinsic motivation. So mine, when I say I don't want people to copy me, if they want to copy me, fine. I'm, I'm fine with people using me as a role model. But really, what do you care about? And then act on that. So if I had said to him, not fly, and he might have gone for a while with not flying, but if he was doing it just because I told him to, I don't think he would have influenced others. I don't think he would keep, keep at it himself. Whereas now he's doing it for his own reasons. I focus on what the person wants to do based on their own internal, what they care about. Because the first thing they do may be big, it may be small, but if they care about it, they'll do more and they'll share it with others. And if it's meaningful and they care about it, it will inevitably become big. In, in my geeky language, I'm not so concerned about the y-intercept. I'm more interested in the slope. And so if the slope is leading to more and more and more, they'll eventually reach big. Because I didn't start with big stuff. I didn't start with not flying. Early on, it was just turning lights off when I wasn't in the room. Not particularly a big deal. But that's how we learn. You know, the little things, when you master them, they become easy and then eventually trivial. You don't even have to think about them. 
And then the hard things eventually become easy and the impossible things become hard. And then it keeps going and eventually things become easier. So I try not to focus so much on the what they do, but people's motivations. What do we care about? And how can we act on that? I lose the ability to pick what the person does, but I gain leadership that they that they feel inspired they feel motivated they feel that they're doing something meaningful and purposeful do you or do you not celebrate the uh, when uh, the benefits of peer influence like when that when that person stopped buying those pallets of bottled water and the coworker said she's stopping now too did that matter to you Oh yeah, I probably gave her a high five. Because that's, I mean, that is a great benefit of, sounds like you, the important thing is that he's acting with some integrity about that. But it seems to me like it's really great if that spreads like wildfire. Oh yeah, let me give you a bigger one on that. Is actually before, I think it was before my podcast at all, I was coaching a guy uh, working at Exxon and he was a an environmental engineer. He had a PhD in environmental engineering of some sort. And he's being moved into management. So it's a straight leadership and it's straight mainstream coaching. They said this is not environmental related. Normally when I meet with him, it's an hour of coaching time, but there's a, a bit of chatting before and a little bit of chatting afterward because you get to know these people pretty well. And I mentioned in passing that how I was not throwing the garbage out that much. At that point, it wasn't once every 16 months. And one time he mentions to me that it had been three weeks, or it might have been three months, three something, th- that since he last thrown out the trash. And he normally threw out his garbage once a week. And I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, how come? And he goes, oh, because I was listening to you and following what you were doing, and I wanted to see if I could do it. I thought, okay, that's cool. I, I'm glad that he followed my lead, even though that wasn't part of what the coaching was about. A few months later, he told me, Josh, the skills that I learned in generating less trash at home, I applied at work. And so I made work decisions based on those skills, but those decisions affected Latin America. So he learned things on a very small scale at home, but applied them broadly to affect, I don't know, millions of people. Same skills, just applied in a corporate setting. So these little things- Probably tons of waste impact. Yeah. It was like what Exxon does in Latin America is partly affected by his generating less trash at home. And that's part of the reason why I try to reach very influential people, because very influential people, small differences can make big differences. Small personal differences with them can follow to very large numbers of people otherwise. Right now, I can't think of any well-known figure, in whether it's politics or business or the arts, entertainment, sports who is trying to live sustainably and is sharing that it's joyful. Even Greta is like, it's panic. I, I, I support Greta. Yeah. I don't want to, but she's not saying like, yeah. you're going to enjoy this. She, and the message like the house is on fire. I agree. And it's, she's definitely influencing and leading a lot of people, but okay, grant her. Who else is saying you're going to enjoy this? Who else is trying to live sustainably? DiCaprio? Gore? It's not, they're not doing it. And we don't really have role models. Little differences by some people can make a big difference. So all the, what I'm trying to get at is that individual action is, first of all, not separate from group action. Either or is, to me, doesn't make any sense. Let's do all of it. And if we were going to enjoy it, why not do it, enjoy it? Because it's joyful. Who decided that we needed to pick one and stick with that? And that was going to be the only thing that we were going to do. It's one or the other uh, for everything. It's one or the other. Why can't we just do? That's a common theme out there yeah, right now, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it really is. Population or overconsumption. You cannot be working on both. Yeah. And, you know, sort of piggybacking to what you said about we us having no role models out there. I always hear yeah, Erica, it doesn't really matter what I do or what you do. Maybe if Jeff Bezos decided to do something, then maybe that would matter. But I think we really need to wait for the big players to do something about our problems. The fastest, most effective way to influence corporations and government is to act ourselves. Exactly. History has borne it out over and over. Like these organizations or these big players are composed of people. And it's about just... 
being the change that you want to see and influencing that. It spreads. It's contagious. Even this conversation right here with you, I feel your dedication to everything that you do. And that's already spreading over here into Colorado. And all of it matters. I, I, I don't know why that's so hard for people to understand. Two weeks ago, I gave actually my third TEDx talk. So it oh, was... Uh, you're up to three now. Yeah. <laughs> and up. originally, I was going to close it with a message that I've been using a lot to respond to what one person does doesn't matter, which was the the Henry V Agincourt, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers from Shakespeare that I'll, I'll mention briefly. I didn't really know this until I looked up. I just knew the phrase, we band of brothers. So it was 1415. The British are trapped in France. It's the Hundred Years' War. To get back home, they have to go through the French and they're outnumbered, I think, four or five or six to one. And... Westmoreland says, I wish some of the people at home sleeping in England were here now for us to fight, to increase the odds. And Henry V says, we who are here are the ones who will do this. We don't need anybody else. Anyone else means less honor for me and I want more honor. And years from now, when St. Crispin's Day comes, we will stand tall and we will open up our sleeves. And so this is the scars that we got on this day, and others will shrink away and wish that they were us. And we will always be brothers. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. And this is what happens when people get together and you come, become a team and you feel strong, and you feel you can connect. I think it's one of the great feelings is to feel a part of something greater than yourself. That means that it's greater than you. It means that you are not the whole thing. And I've been using that for a while. It motivates me. And a friend of mine told me about one of his great role models, Winston Churchill. And he told me about how they, I forget the exact phrasing, but it was uh, Queen Victoria said, you know, something like there, there will be no contingency plans. But he also talked about Dunkirk. And if you don't mind my sharing a bit about it, because I looked it up recently, that the year 1940, the Allies were retreating and retreating and retreating. And uh, London was being pummeled and being bombed all the time. It looked like it was probably going to lose. The Nazis were basically occupied all of Western Europe and the British plus a few French and uh, some allies, some Belgians were trapped at Dunkirk Beach, basically sitting ducks. And the beach there is so shallow, so far out that large boats couldn't come to evacuate them. And they were, it appeared that they were lost the call went out through England that they had to do whatever was possible. And so the little ships of Dunkirk went out. So it was hundreds of ships. I, I'm I, sorry, I still get choked up talking about this, that they went and I put a picture up of this 14.7 foot boat. There were hundreds of thousands of men trapped there. What is a 14 foot sailboat going to do? Why is it bothering me to go across? And yet it went across. And I try to think to myself, what would it be like to be in that boat? And you're going to pass a, a destroyer or battleship that can't actually do anything until you do something. Only by those little boats, maybe a couple troops at a time were doing something. And what would it be like to be on the big boat, to look at the little boat saying, we're all in this? Wow, that is so perfect. And now also imagine, imagine you had a boat and you didn't go, and we lost. And so I, to me, I, I have a certain affinity to that boat. I feel like I am that boat. We could all be that little boat. Mm -hmm. And this is our Dunkirk. Why would we not go? Actually, there's, on the top of that boat, it's now in a museum. And at the top of the boat, I found out by chance that the, the flag on it is, I believe it's called the Dunkirk Jack. It is a flag that only the civilian ships that evacuated Dunkirk can fly that. <laughs> this gets me. Only boats that were involved with that can fly that flag. I can't imagine how much the owners of those boats love to fly that flag. And to think of giving what they could. I mean, isn't that what we want? I mean, creature comforts. I'm a big fan of creature comforts. 
It is nothing compared to helping someone who is helpless to being hurt from your actions and instead helping them. Future generations are going to look back. I mean, they're not going to look back and say, I envy flying whenever I wanted, wherever I wanted to go. They're going to look back at horror at stuff like that because they're going to be living in, hopefully we'll find ways to clean this stuff up, but a lot of stuff, it'll take a long, long time for it to clean up. Yeah. I don't think that people look back at their actions in the Montgomery bus boycott and say, oh man, that was really tiring. I wish I hadn't walked so much. <laughs> and this is all stuff. Another thing for my TED, TED talk that I alluded to more there is that I'd like to think that if I were alive in the first half of the 19th century, that I would make my home available as a way station on the Underground Railroad. Do I think that any of them thought that they were going to stop slavery by themselves? No way. I mean, it, was, it, it, could, it might have been generations away that the Civil War changed that. But I like to think that I would still... They're in the history books for a reason, because I think that for us to follow in their footsteps when the time comes. It feels like the time is now. I want to follow in their footsteps. I, you know, I grew up and I would watch I Have a Dream. I thought everybody wanted to influence the world in that way. I don't know if everyone wants to be a leader or make a difference, but to those who do, and I think the listeners of this podcast do because we're currently a very small minority of people who recognize the issue of population and growth. This is one of the great opportunities to make a difference. And what it takes is doing everything with all of our hearts. This is, I, I don't like to get too much into carbon dioxide and methane and mercury and plastic because those are the results of our behavior and our behavior results from our beliefs, our images, our stories. And my life is about following in the footsteps of my great heroes that originally it was Gandhi, Mandela, MLK, uh, Havel, and increasingly also includes um, Muhammad Ali, uh, George Patton, Eisenhower, JFK, Churchill, and we are living in, in those times. And it's perfectly fine for people. I mean, Oscar Schindler of Schindler, there's a reason we make a movie about him, even though there are plenty of people who saw the exact same thing happening around them. And they said, what can I do? I, what one person does can't really make that much of a difference. I'll just keep my nose down and hopefully the authorities or some government or someone will fix it. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't make movies about them. And of course, Schindler was not the only one. He represents many others. Those movies aren't there for show. I mean, yes, they're entertaining. And yes, it's great acting and so forth. But it's now. This is it. I mean, this is the time to be, to lead yourself, to lead others. This is some of the most meaningful. I mean, look, I wish it wasn't coming to this. Yeah. But the population growth is going really fast up. And people who say it's leveling off, all the projections that say it's going to level off by 2100, it's still growing exponentially at that time. All the projections, they still show the exponent is still greater than one. And every sign that I see is that we're in overshoot. Yeah. And you can level off all you want. If the earth can sustain less than what we have now, and it looks like two, three billion is, is what's sustainable. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you level off at 10. It doesn't matter if you level at seven. You're just forestalling the inevitable. I want to say something too about privilege. And, you know, that's, that's, I'm sure something that, that you talk about, something that I'm sure you've encountered and how that relates to individual action and that it's coming from people who are coming from places of social privilege, economic privilege, uh, racial privilege, and, this idea that we're trying to tell people what to do with their lives. But I would argue that if you don't care about this stuff and you are not able to see how bad things really are, then you're the privileged one. You're the one that's that's choosing to 
basically ignore individual action as something that you could do right now. It's not going to fix everything, but you're actually more privileged by denying that individual action actually matters. I get that a lot. I mean, one of the main places where I see it is that my no packaging has led to my famous no packaging vegetable stews. I host people all the time. Well, COVID will change that. But I have people over a lot and I show them how I make my stews and there's nothing to throw away at the end. Send me the recipe, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Please. Yeah. It's more of a formula. I'll send the link that I responded to someone of, of how to do it because it's, it's, it's not just one recipe. If you, you can swap the ingredients around very easily and it's different every time. I've never had the same stew twice. Wow. And a lot of people say, well, you can do this because you're privileged in some way. And the, actually, the way that they say it is, but what about a single mom in a food desert? And she's got to feed kids and she doesn't have time for this stuff. And there's a couple things. The main one is that one time I was at a, a potluck lunch and I'm just talking to the woman next to me. Turns out she's a single mom in a food desert. Her son is there and she lives up in the Bronx. And we talk a whole bunch of stuff. It happened that my mom was there too. So it was like all of us talking and having a good time. And at the end of it, I'm like, why don't you come by? Have some stew. Maybe we can do a podcast together. And she's like, sure, I'll come by. She invited me to go up to the Bronx to teach them how to do what I do. She's like, this is what we've been looking for. Hmm. And accessibility has, oh, okay. No one has ever asked me, hey, Josh, have you struggled? Have you had any trouble? It's something about me. Maybe I don't know what. They just think I have just had an easy cushy. I don't know what they think, but they don't think that I understand <laughs> yeah. difficulty. That's, I don't know. I'm not trying to fight that. You got your PhD in astrophysics, just saying. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny thing. They're like, if I say, but look, I, I did this. And then a lot of times they say, see, that shows how privileged you are. That's but, not easy. <laughs> so, but the point is that the people who say that tend to be more privileged than me, not less. And she's not the only single mom from a food desert that was like engaged and was like, teach me this. So it's, at least in this case, it's very useful. And I can tell you, I've spent a lot less money on travel since not flying. And I've gotten a lot more of different cultures and different foods and things like that. The other thing is that, why do people say it? Let's say I'm the most privileged person ever in all of history. What does that affect? I think that, I think what happens a lot is that someone will say, Okay, if I'm watching sports now, I see someone doing something that I wish I could do. And then I say, well, how come they're doing it and I can't? And I say, oh, when I was younger, I could. I'm not that young anymore, so I can't do that anymore. Now I'm excused. Now I don't feel bad about not doing it. And so I think a lot of people, and everyone's unique. I don't know. I'm not, I, I don't have access to their minds. But I think a lot of people think, why is this, per this person's doing something? I ought to do that too. I want to do that. Oh, but I can't. I got to work. Oh, Josh probably doesn't have to have work. He probably snaps his fingers and like money just appears in his hands or something like that. Whatever it is, they think you can do something because you're special. I can't because I don't have mm -hmm. whatever you have. And now I feel better about myself. And that's why I like to focus on the emotions and the feelings and the stories because I'm not trying to get into a logical thing with people. If I get into a logical debate with people, oh, you actually can do this. They win in their minds because they've had years and years, as had I, and I still do on lots of things, I, I catch myself all the time, of saying the reason I can't do it is because of X and other people who can, they can do because of Y. If I had Y instead of X, I could too. And stuck in their minds is the idea that they can't and they have full justification. And the more I engage on that, the more that justification will become stronger. But in her case, that's why I really like the food. It's like the food tastes really good. And I mean, the main ingredients are beans, $2 a pound dry. They will stay on your shelf for years. And then the root vegetables, like sweet potatoes, pretty cheap. Or I might use regular potatoes or carrots or beets. Like these things are really cheap. They stay on your shelf a long time. And what people are very surprised to find is how good it tastes. There's other ingredients too. And they're actually, they're very surprised. They often say like, what spices are you going to put in there? And I say, wait till you taste it. And they're like, yeah, but it's not going to taste good. And I, sometimes they see, like, uh, I made a stew the other day. It was uh, split peas, beets, and cabbage, Ooh. and nutritional yeast and water. All right, so the three main ingredients are legumes, green leafy vegetable, starchy vegetable, nutritional yeast, and water. I let people put in salt to taste. I can put in some spices I want, but I generally don't. Uh, well, sometimes I do. And someone will look at that. They'll see what goes into it. 
And sometimes I'll serve that to someone and they will say this, this is really good. What'd you put in it? And they saw every ingredient that went in. They saw everything. Yeah. And I think that they see, all right, healthy, taste bad. Healthy, taste bad. Healthy, taste bad. Okay, a bunch of ingredients that all taste bad. It's going to taste bad. And then they taste and it like, tastes good. And then you train your taste buds to not crave all of the crap that you're used to eating. Yes. And you're used to eating now really healthy and you don't need all that extra stuff. In fact, you can't stand that extra stuff. It, yeah, it gives you headaches. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just it fills you with disgust. Like if you ate it, it would give you headaches, but I... There's not enough money in the world to make me eat a Twinkie. Ew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you find the joy. Did you say that because it's vegan? A Twinkie? It's technically vegan. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah, technically vegan. Uh, I knew some of the vegans in my high school that would eat Twinkies <laughs> like no other. And uh, I admit, I still eat meat. But, you know, I, I had to ask, like, I don't. If that's your diet, I don't think you as a vegan are healthier than me eating some meat every now and then. <laughs> but We're recording this mid-March, so we're just, as we speak today, into the big coronavirus emergency in the United States. And uh, so who knows what has taken place since we recorded this episode. But there was a comment I got in my email yesterday from a massage therapist that I know who said that she had gone into the a couple of supermarkets, she didn't really need anything, but she just wanted to see what everybody was buying because the news has been that the shelves are bare. Everything's flying off the shelves. Everybody's stockpiling. And she was just flabbergasted that all the really healthy food, there was plenty of that. But the the crap, the Twinkies and stuff, that was the stuff that everybody's swept off the shelves. There's no meat. There's a co-op near me where I shop and they have the bulk food section where you can get beans and stuff. Uh, where I do. And I was just like, can I just get the bag before you put it in the dispenser container thing? And they're like, sure. So I bought a 25 pound bag of, of lentils. And yeah, people aren't getting that. Actually, there's I've been kind of playing around with this idea. This is just a, a, a toy idea, not, nothing really meaningful. That I, Before the COVID stuff, I was thinking, I guess this is kind of related to uh, UBI, uh, universal basic income. I thought, give everyone in the country a pressure cooker and then every month give them 50 pounds of beans. You can't really trade this stuff. You can't really hoard it. And it's really useful. And I mean, lentils in the pressure cooker, four minutes cooking time. Four minutes. Yeah, no, I believe it. My grandma had nine, no, sorry, six kids. And my great grandma before her had 13. We're Latino, so, you know, I'm not going to get into stereotypes. But uh, yeah, they pretty much survived on beans for the most part. My mom grew up eating beans, and that's what I grew up eating, too. And yeah, you could really survive on the oh, most... You should see me eating... <laughs> minimal ingredients. My, food. my friends are like, Josh, you don't have to say how much you like it every single time. I'm like, I can't help it. <laughs> I mean, can you eat a mango by yourself? It's kind of hard, isn't it? You want someone there to enjoy it with you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's part of the reason why people tweet about food so much, is because it's so good. You want to share it. That's what... I'm, it connects with people. And... So does not flying. I mean, one flight will bring you to a distant loved one. Flying in general makes it so that loved ones are distant in the first place. The more you fly, the less time you spend with your family, the less control you have over your career. I know it doesn't seem that way when you're thinking of the deprivation. You feel like when you're addicted, you know the withdrawal, but you don't know what's past it. I spend more time with the people that are close to me, and that means my family gets closer the more you fly, the less time you spend with family, the less control you have over your career, the less access you have to money. There's an image that, have, that has come to mind recently that is a bull is a very strong animal and you put a ring through its nose and now you can pull it around wherever it wants. And craving is what our culture in general has figured out. We're being pulled around by the nose and our strength is worthless because we're just getting pulled around by this ring around our nose of it's the apps in our in our phones and it's the craving that we want to... Like, when I hear bucket list, I hear craving. Bucket list equals craving. It means you don't have. means want, 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 want. means want more. More means it's growth. If Buddha were alive today, or Jesus or Aristotle or Lao Tzu, pick your luminary or whatever, I don't think Buddha would be like, I thought I was happy before, but now with an iPad and a jet, now I'm really happy. Yeah. I think Buddha would say, ah, more distraction. More stuff that I have to like kind of know it's there, but I really, 
you know, self-awareness and, and growth and uh, personal growth at this stage, you know, learning more and, and spending time with family, whatever it is for that makes people happy. I think they'd be like, okay, the jet is just gonna be yet another distracting thing. But meanwhile, I'm going to be happy the way that I have always been happy. I don't think we don't have new emotions today that people before us didn't have. We have the same emotional system and therefore the same access to joy and rage and happiness and, you know, forlorn and whatever. But if we feel that the way to access some of it has to come through fossil fuels, that takes it away from our lives. It gives us less. It makes us dependent on others. We're going to have less of the emotions that we want, not more. And we're going to depend on, we're going to get it when, well, people who sense that you want joy, I'm going to figure out a way to get your money by selling you access to something that you have access to anyway. Because since for hundreds of thousands of years, there were humans before we had airplanes, people had happiness and joy and things like that. We don't have more of that now. We just have someone keeping us from it unless we pay them. Yeah, really well said, well said. You know, we had um, a couple of other things on our list of things that we wanted to chat with you about, but I want to propose that we consider wrapping up this conversation and plan on a part two. I think that's a really good idea. But before we wrap this up, I'm just curious to hear what are some of your recommendations or advice for the addicts out there who (laughs) do struggle with giving all this stuff up and experience these cravings? Uh, How do you get through that? There's a couple things. The main one is the technique. When I started my podcast out, I was actually trying to get people. I thought if they try things like I've tried, then they'll experience things that I've experienced and they'll like it. And the early episodes you can hear, they could hear it coming. And they could hear me about to say, like, can you do something for the environment? And they'd preempt it by saying all the things that they're already doing. So they could say, oh, I'm one of the good guys, Josh. (laughs) And I developed this process that the first TEDx talk talks about, which is this four steps of ask them what the environment means to them. Then, and you're going to get that platitude at first. You got to get to what's more meaningful and then ask them to do something based on what they care about and then help them out by making it a smart goal, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time bound. And then ask them afterward how it went. And invariably, I don't think I'm batting a thousand, but pretty high up, over 90% of the people come back and they're like, oh, I wish I'd done more of this. I, I wish I'd done it earlier. I'm really glad to do it. I want to do more. And so if you watch my first TEDx talk, you'll see the process. If you listen to my podcast, you'll get a lot of stories. I would say start with the episode with Dave because he was one of the people that was on the podcast. And I love Dave what was it that it came up with? I forget his motivation, but I know that it was riding his bike more. Yeah. If I remember right, you live on a hill <laughs> and that the riding led you to get over, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was easier than you expected and you took on more riding. Yeah, yeah, because it's a horrible hill to ride up to get home. It's a psychological barrier, but I was amazed at how fast I got over that barrier. And and now I'm kind of bummed when uh, the weather keeps me from using my bicycle to get someplace instead of the automobile. I enjoyed that episode. And that was one of the, your earlier recording sessions, I think. And I want to just mention, we'll be sure to include links in the show notes to your uh, TEDx talks and to that episode with me. And I think you have an episode or two where you talk about the joy of uh, of not flying, about your experience with giving up jet travel. Definitely a recurring theme. Yeah. Um, So if there's an episode or two that we can include links in the show notes to those, that would be great. If you listen to episodes, you'll hear, I mean, just look at the guests that I've had. The later ones tend to be more effective than the earlier ones. And if you try it, start from what matters to you. Start from the joy. Start from something that, I mean, sometimes it's a joy. Sometimes it's, it's feeling something missing from your childhood. But don't focus on the Y intercept. Not at the beginning. And I would also recommend if you do the process, sit down with someone else, someone supportive, someone, someone non-judgmental, and do it to them and have them do it to you. You don't have to pick the same thing together. You'll almost certainly pick different things, but the emotional journey will probably be similar. There's just no substitute for... I mean, if you had asked me how to play piano, I would say you got to play a lot of scales. And if you want to play Carnegie Hall... You might say a scale, what's that? That's nothing. That really won't bring me closer to Carnegie Hall. But I think the people who play Carnegie Hall played the most scales. And so you got to start with sometimes stuff that seems so small that you don't really get it. But the doing reveals 
the joy and the mastery. Ultimately, the reason I get choked up when I talk about Dunkirk, for example, is that I'm expressing something deep within myself that comes through identifying a passion and acting on it. And, you know, trees and streams, I mean, you can pave them over and make a lot of money, but I think that these are, the, and, and vegetables and the call of birds in the wild, I mean, maybe there are people who don't care, really, truly don't care. I haven't met that person yet. It, it really deeply resonates. And it's not going to come from the first thing. It's not, it might, it might, it might come from the second thing. And also the connection with the people that you love, that you miss, you'll get more of it. The more you act in accordance with your environmental and community values. I don't know if that answers your question. Perfect. This is a great opportunity to to lead others, to lead yourself, to be that little boat. Well, man, I am going to go back and study that Dunkirk story. That is just the most perfect way to explain why we are so busy doing our own little things and thinking that it matters and knowing that it matters. Just imagine if all those people had just sat on the shore and not gotten in their little boats and said, well, yeah, there's not much we can do. We're going to have to wait for helicopters to be invented. The system's against us. The system is rigged. Well, this brings us to the end of another episode of the Growth Busters podcast. Thank you so much, Joshua Spodek, for joining us. And uh, be sure to check the show notes because we'll have links to some of the interesting, very interesting things we've talked about. If you do think that this podcast is important, subscribe on your podcast app and recommend it to your friends. It's free. And always, you can find us at growthbusters.org. You can search for the Growth Busters podcast on Facebook, Spotify, and you can even ask for it when you're talking to your Alexa smart speaker. I'm Dave Gardner reminding you that friends don't let friends miss the real story on sustainable living. Thanks so much for listening. Some may dream to pay mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster Some they just want more But don't know what it's for But not me I'm a growth buster Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather But no, not us We are the growth busters Calling, 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 call the growth busters.